So good morning, and today we are going to be discussing fluid transfer equipment and operation principles. This is chapter eight in the text, McCabe Smith. And so today we're probably gonna be primarily discussing um, fluid transfer equipment of incompressible fluids. Wednesday, I hope to talk about operating curves, pump and system curves, and then Friday we'll talk about fluid transfer equipment for compressible fluids. Also, one quick thing I do wanna know, I did post grades in Blackboard late Friday night. Um, you should see one of several grades, including an attendance grade, a homework grade, which is a combination of both your homework assignments grades, as well as the synthesis assignment grades. Then you have quiz grade, your midterm exam grade, which is essentially just the grade you made on the exam, and then a midterm grade, which shows up first, which is essentially your current grade in the class. It should give you both um, a percentage and a letter grade so that you can kind of see where you are. Now those will be posted as required by the end of today, but if you have any last minute questions or issues, try to send me an email before noon today because I plan to, to do some double checking on some of the attendance things that people have been bringing to my attention. Any last minute questions or things that I can clarify before we jump into today's lecture material? Is there a way that you've been taking attendance like with maybe the email we signed into Zoom with? Because I know sometimes it uses my non Ole Miss email and sometimes it uses my Ole Miss email. Is there something we could do to make it easier for you? Uh, I put the graders in charge of that, okay. which is why I have them show up every day, and they just go off of what they see in the, uh, basically your little boxes. So, Carly says Carly Hewley, Levi says Levi Patiks. Understood. And so that's you. what they're going off of. So, if you end up having to use some issue associated with that, or if there's an issue getting in on time and stuff, you can go ahead and send me and the grader an email. Okay. And we can keep that in mind. All right. Thank you. No problem. All right. So today we're going to be talking about fluid transfer equipment. You guys have a preference for color today? Black. All right, don't fix it if it ain't broken. So the first thing we can mention is differences associated with pipes and tubes. Though admittedly I use the terms interchangeably. In general, a pipe is considered A thick wall transferring system, or I should say fluid transfer system. Or we also consider these to be moderately large diameters. Moderate lengths. And these systems can be made out of a variety of materials. For most industrial purposes, it's usually some form of, you know, carbon steel.
You can have stainless steel. There's a lot of things that you'll see. Carbon steel, a lot of times people try to get away with in certain situations if you can. And in some cases, you can have lined piping. You can have a nickel alloys, things like that. And these types of materials can be threaded. Now this is in contrast to what we consider of tubing, which are very thin walled, small diameters. Typically comes as with smooth walls. I don't know why it keeps jumping. Yeah, it's coiled often. With their nominal sizing. determined. By pipe diameter, and wall thickness. Which we, you know, we, we've already discussed in terms of scheduling. And so in general, when we're considering, you know, pipes versus tubing, pipes are going to be used more towards, you know, large scale processes. Tubing is going to be considered for some transporting small amounts of fluid. Um, if you have things that are extremely sensitive, tubing is helpful in that you can, you can have a, a wide variety of, of materials as well. But you also see a lot of um, these systems uh, existing in as plastics. And you also see a lot of sterile material. You see a lot of sterile tubing that exists. So a lot of biological, biomedical applications associated with uh, biological fluids. You're going to see a lot of you know specialty tubings that have been properly sterilized that have particular coatings to minimize any sort of uh, damage to the fluids of, in it that you're transporting. When you're like thinking in terms of more uh, industrial aspects, uh, piping and pipes is, is where you're gonna go. Any questions on those kind of two concepts in terms of how we can differentiate what we consider pipes and piping uh, versus tubes and tubing? All right, the next thing we can then discuss is um, some considerations. for proper pipe diameter. And so in general, for turbulent flow, because that's where we're gonna be operating 95% of the time, we can consider that capital costs for piping follows a law that states the cost is proportional to the nominal pipe diameter to the one-fifth power. However, operating costs associated with modifying a pipe diameter, we find that it follows a law where operating costs 
reduce or are reduced with increasing pipe diameter. And we see on average, uh, operating costs are proportional to the diameter to the negative 4.8 power. So this means is that there's an optimal pipe diameter to minimize total costs. Considering both capital and operating costs. And we can state that in these systems, we can calculate an optimal velocity, which is equal to 12 times your mass flow rate to the 0.1 power divided by density to the 0.36 power, which means for a given fluid transfer system, there exists an optimal flow velocity and pipe diameter. So given a desired flow rate with a given fluid, you can estimate the optimal flow velocity. From that flow velocity, you can then calculate an optimal pipe diameter, where since we know that mass flow rate is equal to density times velocity times area, which equals density times velocity times pi times diameter squared over four, we can state that the optimal diameter is then four times the mass flow rate divided by your density times pi to the square root times pi times your optimal velocity to the square root. One thing that you want to keep in mind is that more often, or I should say in general, you cannot obtain a realistic operating parameter when solving for your optimal velocity and your optimal diameter. And what I mean by that is that, let's say you solve for your optimal velocity and you get, I don't know, 4.32 feet per second, which corresponds to an optimal diameter of 3.764 inches. This is just an example. Well, you may only have certain sizing to choose from depending on necessary materials of construction and, and manufacturing, excuse me, manufacturer selection. And so if your optimal diameter, let's say is 3.864 and you have to choose between, you know, 3.068, 3.568 and 4.122, you're not gonna go and tell the manufacturer, well, I, I, I need a 3.764 inch diameter. They say that's tough. These are the selections that you have to choose from. And so that's, it's an important thing to keep in mind 
when doing these calculations. They provide data to make the decision, but at the end of the day, you have to make the decision. So that means you have to pick the diameter that's closest to the optimal that, or that works best given your limitations. Is that clear in that regard? If yes, shake your black square. All right, I got I got a couple thumbs up. We should we should work on our our, our emojis in this class. I'll let Zoom know that they need more emotes. And so, following this, for incompressive so so some rules of thumb because we're engineer and we kind of go by our rules of thumb. And so for incompressible fluids, your U-optimal is typically between three and six feet per second. And for compressible fluids, U optimal is a little higher, somewhere between 20 and 80 feet per second, which makes sense. And also for systems, i.e. heat exchangers, optimal is higher due to the improvements or improved heat transfer rates at higher velocities. Which means that when, when you're th considering fluid transfer systems that, that, are, that operate as heat exchangers, the, the, you know, the heat exchanger needs kind of trump um, the limitations associated with capital and operating costs associated with the fluid, fluid dynamics of the situation. You're going to want to get the heat transfer uh, over, save some energy when it comes to the fluid transfer. All right, on to a next topic, which is going to be looking at valves. So can anyone tell me what is a valve's primary purpose? To regulate flow. So the answer we got was to regulate flow. I like that answer. Follow up question, how does a valve regulate flow? By changing the diameter, or not diameter, but area for which fluid can flow. Yes and no. That's not, that's, that's part of it. Let's see if I can draw a valve. Probably not, but you know, I'm going to try anyways. So let's say I've got flow through a pipe, our wonderful forever example. But now this pipe is going to have some, like a wall to it. So 
So in this flow system, we're just going to say we have some, you know, type of valve that operates. To obstruct flow, in a sense. So yeah, not the best drawing of a valve. And so this valve can open or close to mm, manipulate our flow system, correct? This is actually look, looking like a check valve. And so what we find when we're looking at valves is that it regulates flow by manipulating head loss in our system. Right, if we go back to chapter, what is it, five, we talked about fittings and fitting losses. What page was that on? Page 124, you can see if you looked at the standard gate valve, a gate valve wide open had a fitting loss of 0.17. At half open, it had a fitting loss of 4.5. And you can imagine if it was even further closed, that fitting fitting head loss um, value would be even higher. And so for these systems, our KF for a valve can increase or decrease based on our valve setting. And this allows us to manipulate F within our flow system. You know, so essentially, we, we see a ceiling in our energy loss associated with the valves being fully open. And closing those valves restricts the flow. And if it was fully closed, then we would get no flow. And so, you know, you can, you can kind of argue that your KF can approach infinity when it comes to, you know, having a fully closed valve. That argument kind of works, but I really don't like thinking of it like that way. What I what I really tend to consider is is the statement that I've said here, and that we can manipulate our KF value based on our valve settings. Now, there's there's a large variety of valves when it comes to fluid transfer systems. Your synthesis assignments is going to be associated with exploring some of these valve types but it's important to consider how the presence of a valve in a system exists to regulate flow. And when you get into things like process control, there's a whole lot of things a valve can do. For example, if I've got a system like this, and let's say I have a valve, and I want it to control something associated with my process, Let's say I want it to control the pressure entering a reactor. So this is a reactor. And I want to control the pressure of the fluid as it enters the reactor. Well, I can put a little temperature sensor here, or a pressure sensor. That pressure sensor can then transmit data to a pressure controller, and that pressure controller can manipulate that valve by opening and closing as needed to ensure that the pressure value 
minus the set point is or approaches zero. So, you know, this is when you guys get into process control. This is not the true equation, but it's essentially for all intents and purposes illustrated of what it is, you know. So the actual value versus what your set point generates an error signal. The error signal goes to controller and that tells the controller what to do with the valve. And so using valves within fluid transfer systems in conjunction with control systems, you can generate stable process operations. And so valves are a very big and vital process part of maintaining a stable chemical process as it pertains to fluid transfer within your system. So that was, I know, a, a little long of a, of a discussion, but you guys are starting to kind of get what I'm saying when it comes to valves and valve operation, how they work and why it's, why it's important and vital. Any questions associated with pipes, tubing, and valves so far? All right, in that case, we can keep moving on. And for the rest of the day, we're probably gonna talk about pumps as it relates to transferring incompressible fluids i.e. liquids. Now there are three different types of pumps that we can consider. We have positive displacement pumps. rotary pumps oh, excuse me not rotary pumps and centrifugal pumps so we have oh excuse me we have two types of major pumps and we have three types of positive displacement pumps So the major categories are positive displacement and centrifugal. And within positive displacement, we have a few different types. We have rotary pumps, reciprocal pumps, reciprocating pumps, and we have peristaltic pumps. So let's jump into a positive displacement pumps. And so let's look at positive displacement pumps. So for these, what we typically see is alternating a chamber with a definitive volume of fluid, which is pressurized and 
and discharged. So that means what you typically see is, is a form of fluid comes in, fluid isolated, fluid pressurized, and then fluid discharged. And then this cycle repeats. And so you have this cyclical essentially motion for pressurizing the fluid of interest. So there's a, a couple advantages of positive displacement pumps. Those being, you can handle fluids that are shear sensitive. So things like non-Newtonium fluids are good candidates for positive displacement pumps. You can operate at very high pressures. And so you can imagine systems with extremely high pressures existing thanks to positive displacement pumps, things on the order of, you know, 10 atmospheres well above. And can handle with variable viscosity. The disadvantages associated with positive displacement pumps is typically that, that you typically can't handle large volumes. Of fluid. So this is going to be more specialty operations, not full scale process engineering type systems. And so let's, you know, to take a little look at some, some of these types of pumps. This image that you see here is an example of just a single action reciprocating pump, where hopefully you can see my mouse move a little bit. You have a piston that essentially brings fluid in and out of the system while pressurizing. You have two check valves. And as the piston acts on the fluid, it basically pressurizes both sides of the system it keeps this chuck valve, keeps the fluid from leaving out of the inlet. And essentially once the fluid pressure exists at the desired pressure, the check valve will open and it will allow the fluid to discharge. Then as the fluid's discharged, the piston will come back. It will create a negative pressure in this chamber which will cause this check valve to close. Then the negative pressure will cause this check valve to open to allow more fluid in. And then the piston comes back, closes this one, pressurizes, which then allows this to open, and then the cycle continues. Do you guys kind of understand that operating principle and how this valve operates? It's kind of a neat little system relying on two check valves to handle. Uh, 
the high pressure as well as the, the negative pressure. And keep, and keep the negative pressure associated with, which we call suction pressure in mind, because we'll talk about the importance of issues that can arise associated with the, the suction pressure. Some other types that operate on similar principles are these rotary pumps, where you have essentially these teeth that form seals isolating these small volumes of liquid. And as it approaches the discharge, it gets pressurized. Then at the same time, once that fluid is pressurized, you get that suction pressure or that you know partial vacuum, which brings more fluid in, and this cycle continues. And the last type is a, a peristaltic pump. I'll see if this video works. Maybe, maybe not. YouTube can be a little iffy. And in this system, the way this works is these rollers essentially pinch off and isolate volumes of fluid. Then it kind of drags and pushes the fluid and you see at this point, now this roller's gone, but this one's still squeezing that fluid, pressurizing it out into the discharge. This is a, an, a really beneficial type of pump in that it can handle both uh, gases and liquids as well. It, it can operate at very precise flow rates to deliver essentially high precision flow volumes depending on your needs in a system but once again this is these are small applications so you see you know tubing that exists that are plastic that it's flexible that can essentially resist and handle the deformation of the constant deformation associated with the rollers So those are the, the three major categories associated with positive displacements. And you see they all have, you know, the, the key characteristics associated with isolating uh, potential volumes of fluid, which are then pressurized at the discharge. So are there any questions on positive displacement pumps? and how they exist, how they operate, and the key characteristics of how they pressurize um, fluid for fluid transfer. Nope, all right. So the next category that we consider are centrifugal pumps. They operate on a different principle and that they can generate high flow velocities and high flow rates as the major operating principle associated with centrifugal pumps is the, the transfer of kinetic energy into pressure energy. And so when it comes to centrifugal pumps, this is this is your, gonna be your typical workhorse in process operations. As it can, you know, like I said, handle large volumes of liquid. I should probably finish and write the sentence. And so 
the best way that to show you how this works is to show you another diagram. This is a, a figure of essentially the inside of a centrifugal pump where this impeller exists and the center is where the fluid uh, comes in or is intaked. And so there's a suction pressure at the center where the fluid comes in. And as the impeller rotates, it imparts a centrifugal force onto the fluid, which forces the fluid to the edge or the edges of the, um, essentially the impeller and the, and the pump casing. And as, as this rotates, it brings the fluid over into the discharge. And this outlet is designed such that you have essentially all this kinetic energy being input into the fluid. And as it discharges, you, you notice how this, right here, you see here, the, essentially the flow diameter is getting larger and larger. As this flow diameter increases, the velocity is decreasing. However, with that decrease in velocity, you see an increase in the pressure energy associated with the fluid. And so this imparts a high kinetic energy into the fluid, and then this outlet design is such that that kinetic energy is getting converted into pressure energy as the fluid travels from the edges of the impeller casing towards the discharge of your centrifugal pump so that when you get to the discharge you have a steady velocity and you know this high kinetic energy that the fluid experiences is then transferred into pressure energy the end result being you have uh, a greater pressure or a pressure gain associated with the fluid that we, we you know we consider to be head added to the fluid right because by continuity assuming the the suction line and the discharge line has the same diameter the flow rate and the flow velocity is going to be the same thus all this kinetic energy is going to be transferred into pressure energy associated with the fluid Is that clear as mud? Or, or do I need to explain that in a different way? But do you guys kind of understand and see how that impeller essentially inputs a lot of flow energy or kinetic energy into the fluid? And then as that fluid travels, that diameter as, as it moves towards the discharge gets bigger, which means the velocity goes down. And since that energy is, is being taken out of the kinetic energy, it gets converted into pressure energy. All right, and there's a lot of different designs on centrifugal pumps. I don't wanna get into them too much, but they all operate on that principle. And that now we're not really looking at a, a control volume. We're looking at essentially how impeller speed, impeller diameter influences the kinetic energy and thus pressure energy that's imparted onto the fluid. And we can quantify this by considering, you know, in all these systems, we're developing head into our fluid. You're still on the PowerPoint. Okay, still thank you. And so if, let's see, I have a system. the pump moving towards a discharge and I pick my points you know point one point two I can write my energy balance and say that you know p2 rho plus g z2 plus u2 squared over two is equal to or minus p1 over rho plus g z1 plus u2 squared over two equals 
the work that I have in our system. So if I'm looking at a comparison between state one and state two, the difference is the work done on the fluid by the pump. So if this is the head of the fluid at state two, and this is the head of the fluid at state one, I can stay the work is simply the head of fluid two over head of fluid one. Are they supposed to clarify? Both of them? Is it supposed to be velocity two on the right side with H1? Nope, it is not. Thank you. Getting my numbers mixed up. I appreciate that. And here I'll, I'll put it for consistency purposes. We can put it in terms of fluid head by just getting moving the gravities around. All right, so work over G, which is equal to delta H because head has units of length. And so we still get the same approach when we're looking at state two, state one, the difference is the work imparted or the head applied into our system. And so that means is the pump delivers additional fluid head as needed to allow proper fluid transfer. Now one issue and one result that can happen associated with this is something associated with suction pressure. Here, I'll make this a separate discussion. And the fluid being transferred. And I'll leave you guys with some food for thought. So let's say I have a fluid where its current temperature is near its boiling point. So T is, is almost near boiling point and I wanna transfer that fluid using a pump. Two questions I'm gonna leave you with that I want you to think about for Wednesday. The first one being what happens to the pressure of the fluid as it enters the pump. And also, what occurs within the fluid as it enters the pump suction line. So some are questions that are semi-rhetorical as a, this is where we'll start off on Wednesday, but you know, food for thought, things to consider associated with pump operation. When a fluid is, is close to its boiling point, What's gonna happen if I essentially attempt to pump it through either a positive displacement or, or a centrifugal pump? What's gonna happen to the pressure 
of that fluid and is that going to cause any changes within the fluid as it enters the pump. So I think that's a great stopping point for us today. Are there any last minute questions or comments, things I can clarify before we, we call it good? All right, if not, thank you all for attending class today. As always, if you need anything, feel free to send me emails. I'm gonna do be doing some email catch up. So if I haven't responded to you just yet for something you sent me last night or this morning, I will be responding hopefully shortly. Take care guys and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.